welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us as we continue our World Indigenous Lecture Series. Before we begin and I introduce Dr. Sean Wilson, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This territory is included in the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Kingston, Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community, as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. As this lecture series shares and it celebrates Indigenous ways of knowing from around the world, it is important that we take time to acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, languages, cultures, and Indigenous peoples across the globe and recognize the healing and decolonizing journey we all share together. This is the second year of the lecture series, a series that was born out of the need to connect and engage globally when COVID restrictions came into place 18 months ago. The World Indigenous Lecture Series brings Indigenous thinkers from around the world and as Nadia said, is hosted by our World Indigenous Studies and in Education, more popularly known as WISE. And our Indigenization, Inclusivity and Equity Lecture Series also is a sponsor this evening. I'm honored tonight to introduce Dr. Sean Wilson, Wilson from the Opaskwe, uh, sorry, Sean, Opaskwe Act. Uh, Nation. Sean currently lives on, on Bundjalung land on the east coast of Australia. He is an associate professor, community culture and global studies, faculty of arts and social science at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan campus. He previously was a senior lecturer in Indigenous knowledge at Gennady College of Indigenous Australian Peoples at Southern Cross University and an adjunct professor of psychosocial work at Ostfold University College in Norway. At the end of Sean's talk, we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. So as we go along, please put your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And now I'd like to turn it over to Sean and welcome him and say, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks, Nadia. Um, well, and, and just thanks for inviting me to um, to give this little talk. Now, I'm going to uh, share a PowerPoint slide, just like every other boring presentation you've ever attended. <laughs> so hopefully it's, but uh, I'm, I'll do my best not to overwhelm you with this by PowerPoint, though, and uh, hopefully that they'll, well, it's mostly just pictures. So I want to talk today about uh, how we can go about digitizing ceremony. And this is kind of a sort of controversial uh, topic because it's not something that we think about very often. Um, and it's kind of, I think most people would say it's kind of like almost like sacrilege to sort of think about digitizing ceremony. So I'll, I'll walk you through my thinking around this and some of the ceremonies I've done around it. So yeah, I'd like to acknowledge first that I'm on Bunjalang country here in, uh, in Australia and thank the elders for inviting me to live here and thank the land itself for providing, uh, providing me with knowledge and such a nice place to live and work and play. Um, yeah, so if you all could acknowledge the own the territory that you are on right now, not necessarily just the um, traditional owners, but the land itself. Thanks, give thanks to the land itself. Uh, in your own way, in your own mind, right now, that would be a good way for you to start your own uh, learning ceremony, and hopefully, 
you can see that that's what we're involved in as we go along as a bit of a learning ceremony. So I guess I want to start off by introducing myself. myself. That's, I think, always a good place to start. <laughs> and I think that um, the more you know about Indigenous knowledge, the more you'll probably realize that um, <clears throat> everything that we do is we do in relationship. Uh, so I think that part of, um, well, it's not just everything that we do, it's our part of our entire way of thinking about the world, our way of being in the, in the universe and in the cosmos is that everything is in relationship. So a, an important first step in building relationships is introduction. And I think that's generally a big part of uh, any ceremony is that you start introduce you start by off by introducing yourself and, and I think you know there's no no reason to stop doing that just because you're working online um so I'm from El, El Paso Cree Nation which uh if you recognize the globe you'll know that it's right about there <laughs> if you can see my pointer um so I'm uh that's probably not a view of the globe that you're used to seeing actually when I think about it like most cartography puts uh, um, North America at the top in the center of a globe um, and vastly distorts the land masses so that the, the northern hemisphere land masses look much bigger than they actually are. Um, anyway, I just put it the other way around just to get you thinking a little bit about how you view the world and um, recognize that it's the way that we view the world is often shaped by images that are presented to us. Uh, and if those images are distorted, then we're obviously going to have a distorted view of the world as well. Um, so I don't know, I've been living on Bunjilong country for the last six, almost 17 years, actually. <laughs> when I first came up to Bunjilong territory about 25 years ago, uh, I was invited to teach at Southern Cross University on international indigenous issues. We ended up meeting my wife here, so that's why I've kind of been stuck down here. Uh, but, but moving back and forth between Canada and Australia ever since then. So I guess a lot of the work that I do because I travel around between countries so much is also traveling around and meeting with different indigenous people in different parts of the world, um, which I feel incredibly fortunate to um, get to do that. So it's I've really got to work with a lot of different people and sort of look at a lot of the things that we have in common, like the similarities and the distinct things that make our our cultures what they are. Um, so I've got myself really fortunate for that. So I think that for this, as far as this project goes, that that's kind of important because for me, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today come through working with different Indigenous people around the world. Uh, and I and specifically the concept of moving online and trying to figure out how we move online is really sort of um, it was interesting. It sort of started to happen probably about when was it? Uh, kind of like September October before the um, September October twenty nineteen that there were several of us different Indigenous people had, um, well, several people that were sort of uh, how can I put it, spiritually attuned <laughs> to started getting dreams around the idea that we needed to be able to work online better and that we needed to be able to, um, well, just work online better. There's a whole bunch of other messages that were contained in those dreams as well, but it was interesting that we all got a similar message from the land through our dreams around working online. Uh, and then of course, you we all realize what happened, you know, a few months later when the pandemic hit and suddenly we were all happy, forced to be online all the time. So it's like we've, I've, we're, we started working on um, starting to build these ideas and build up what, what's possible to do on, in an online environment. Uh, so that's why I've been working on this project and looking at digitizing ceremony, digitizing different aspects of indigenous knowledge. Um, because of that. So, uh, you know, one of the other big projects that I've been working on is looking at um, Indigenous astronomy and how we can um, protect different aspects of our astronomy 
while sharing other aspects of it. So I guess that's a big part of what I do is looking at Indigenous methodologies, so meeting with different Indigenous people, looking at how they do research, how they think about their world around them. And then, um, I guess, tra not translating is not the right word, interpreting that and, and rewording it and trying to teach other people about it as well. I guess really teaching other people about Indigenous knowledge. Um, all right, so it's important. And so I guess I hope you understand a little bit about me. <laughs> Obviously, you don't understand everything. Uh, oh, actually, this is kind of interesting. These pictures, that's this, uh, the, the day school on our reserve before my dad had to go away to residential school. He went to day school. So that's my father right there in the middle. Um, and how much our schooling system has changed over the years. You know, obviously we, uh, before we wouldn't have had anything such as a day school, like my, when my father grew up, up until, you know, I think he's around nine or 10 here in these pictures, he lived out in the bush on the trap line with my uh, grandparents. So it was for him, his traditional education was received in the bush and learning from, from his parents and learning from his elders. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the, the whole day school and the residential school system really changed our systems of education. Now, from that, I think that, you know, the, our culture around education has totally changed again, so that now that we've got more and more uh, different First Nations communities are, are bringing back their own school system. So this school is a, is a school that's on the, um, sorry, this, this school, and that's over here is in Hawaii, and it's a native Hawaiian school where there are more and more indigenous work, peoples around the world are revitalizing their own cultures through the school system. And even going as far as like the university system, this bottom picture is the uh, at university, of, uh, university of Hawaii. Uh, oh, which campus is it? Muno campus. <laughs> no, that's not right. I can't remember which campus. Um, but anyway, so how they built their own traditional uh, lodge there <laughs> so that they could do, teach in their own traditional style. So it's like, you know, we could recognize how, how much our education system has changed, but I think that that's an important sort of indicator of our cultures in general. Our, you know, as our cultures are live, we're part of living cultures. We we change and we grow to, to engage with our living context. So it's like, um, you know, for example, I really say like the, we've always sort of uh, hunted and gathered from the land as a way of, of, of providing for ourselves. So it's like, as rifles became available, for example, we started to use those for hunting. Uh, snow machines became available, we, that started taking over for dog teams. So there's different, you know, good parts and bad parts about it, uh, how we've changed our cultures, but that's what makes us a living culture is our ability to change that we're not stuck in the past all the time. And of course, our ceremonies have also changed um, and they've adapted to the times and places where we live. Um, but, you know, and just as some of the changes that we have undergone have been good, not all of them have been. Some of the changes have been quite damaging. Um, so I think that that's the main thing I want people to start to think about is how do we deliberately and consciously make changes to make things better? Um, and in, in our culture, but also in uh, the way we conduct ceremony. So I don't want to encourage people to adopt negative influences into our ceremony. Um, but we do need to sort of look at the underlying positive meaning behind how we can do things and then adopt it to adapt it to our current context or current situations. Um, now, when I start to think about ceremony, especially, and I, I, I'm really conscious of how colonialism is, has impacted on Indigenous knowledge. And in particular, the whole concept of knowledge extraction. So colonialism is all about extracting the resources from, from a place, whether that's the human resources, the mineral resources, the whatever resources, but a big resource that they've also currently are doing is extracting our indigenous knowledge and using it without any responsibility. Um, one thing we have to be a bit conscious of and careful of it is that indigenous knowledge 
also holds a lot of knowledge about resistance and how to resist colonization. So we have to be careful with sharing that one because we've got like generations of knowledge and knowing about how to survive colonization. So it's like things like how to lay low, you know, when to laugh, when not to laugh. And But part of that is also about how to hide our ceremonies uh, to keep our ceremonies safe. So we have to be really careful when we start to think about sharing our knowledge that we share it in ways that ensure that the colonizers can't use that knowledge against us, but that we're able to use it for ourselves and use it for the benefit of all of humanity, really. Uh, so those are some of the sort of limitations I've sort of kept in the back of my brain as I started to think about, well, is it possible to digitize ceremony? How can we do that? So yes, our ceremonies have changed and they will always continue to change. I think it's just being, so I'm just encouraging people to be a bit more intentional about how we change them and what we keep and what we make sure we keep the same and what, we're, what we allow to change. And then we change them for the better. All right, so <clears throat> with this in mind, it's like, well, that question in mind, how can we digitize things? How can we get our ceremonies online or is it possible to? Of course, then I had to start about, well, <laughs> how the heck am I going to figure that question out? Um, so it made me think about, ooh, that, that's a really good question. So in general, I would say this is sort of like a research question, right? If I have the research question of how can we digitize ceremonies, like, whoa, it makes you start to think then about, well, you have to have a, an appropriate research methodology that you're going to use. Uh, one of the students that I work with is saying, oh, it's kind of like <laughs> this. So you'll notice that a lot of Indigenous people use a lot of metaphor and analogy. So the woman that sort of introduced this analogy to me isn't Indigenous, but she thinks like an Indigenous person. So that's kind of cool. She said, it's kind of like the rain and the wind. So there's certain things that are invisible to us, like air is invisible to us because we're in it all the time. And that is very similar to our methodology and our philosophy. Our way of understanding the world is not visible to us. It's, it's like the air that's around us. Air only becomes visible when it gets moved or when something like it's raining, then you can see, actually see the wind through its impact on the water as it falls through the sky. So you can only understand really anything about air and wind when you see how it impacts on other things. So as the wind blows the rain, you can sort of see, you can't actually see the wind, but you can see the impact that it has on the rain. So I thought that was a really good analogy for how a research methodology works. So that is, um, methodology is really going to have an impact on what you actually do. So it's not, methodology isn't visible, but it, you can view its results by how it blows things around. <laughs> so that's what I thought. All right. So if I sort of take a, why not use an Indigenous way of actually doing research, use an Indigenous methodology to sort of understand if it's possible to digitize ceremonies, then where am I going to start? So that philosophy impacts on my choice of research methods, right? So the, for me, the where I always start is start with what I already know. So the thing that I already know how to do is, I, well, I already know how to do ceremony uh, and I know how to connect with the land and I know how to, well, I don't know very well, but to the best of my ability, I try to listen to the land. So I try to learn and get lessons from the land. So I thought, well, all right, well, that's, that's where I will start. I will um, conduct a ceremony on the land and sort of ask the land to teach me if and how it is possible to move ceremonies online or do things online. So I hope that's making sense so far. Um, so, this, so these are some of the things that I learned. So um, passing on some of the lessons that I've got from the, the ceremonies that I've undertook, undertook, undertaken. <laughs> um, so this is the first lesson I got, is really understand the importance of the journey 
So there is a, a big part of undertaking ceremony that is in the preparation. So part of that preparation is physically getting yourself to where the ceremony is going to be held. So as like most of us probably don't have like a sweat lodge in our living room, so you can't just have it, go to a sweat and do a sweat. Lodge. You have to travel, even if it's out to your backyard or if it's to out to someone else's place. There's part of that physically getting yourself ready to go is an important part of the process because it really gets you in the right frame of mind and that sort of way of feeling about what you're going to do when you get into to do ceremony, all right? So you do, you do a lot of thinking as you're on your way to where you're going to do the ceremony. Um, and sometimes if you're, if you're doing a ceremony for a first time, you have to really sort of feel out where you're going to do the ceremony because there are different sacred sites in different places around the world and not all of them are known and not all of them are active or activated not all of them were allowed to go to so it's like kind of feeling where you are able to do ceremony where it's going to be a powerful place to do ceremony you're in your you're allowed to do ceremony uh, you know if you're going to go to it with an elder that's going to do the ceremony for you they've already sorted all that stuff out for you but if you're doing it for yourself you have to do all these sorts of things so that physically traveling to the place where you're going to do the ceremony is really important because it's also um that physical journey is also symbolic of the spiritual journey that you are about to undertake so it's physically getting your body ready to undertake a spiritual journey so that you you're preparing your whole body your physical your emotional your mental and your spiritual self to that's the important first stage of the ceremonies to so you're deliberately physically going to a different space so that you can also intentionally spiritually go to a different space so that journey part of getting there, I guess, is just really important. <laughs> I guess. Obviously, these are just my ideas and what I've learned. <laughs> you don't have to believe them if you don't want. And it's, no, that's totally up to you. Um, all right. So then, so that's what I was thinking about on my way to, to do the ceremony, right? Uh, now, the other thing that is important, and I think it's something that I've always thought about, but it was really, really, um, stuck with me or uh, what's the right word came out to me became more in, in, more embedded in my brain uh was whole important of, of the language that we used when i was started to do this ceremony now i don't know my own language very well like so i can speak a few words of cree and i can kind of swear at you in Cree, <laughs> but, it, but I couldn't hold a conversation with you. But it's kind of weird, but I also know a whole lot of terms of philosophy in Cree, which is kind of weird. It's kind of like the opposite of what most people would understand, sort of day-to-day -day language. But I think my, my um, father especially was very careful that he tried to teach us as much as he could about Cree philosophy, even though we couldn't understand the language. Um, so language is important, and it's even though I don't know Cree, I know that praying in Cree changes the form of the prayer that is said. Uh, because it also changes the way that you think about things. So it, the way that you think about things impacts on how you communicate your thoughts. So, it's, And that's also like the, the indigenous languages are languages that come from the land. So I think that they are the best suited to communicating with the land. Um, so I really recognize that the ceremonies that I do are, are really have boundaries and limitations placed on them by the English language because um, English can't express a lot of things that Cree can. So it's um, so it's really it's different. I was thinking of uh, like I know. Oh, you don't need to know that whole story, <laughs> but just recognize that the, the use of our language is really important. So, you know, we, I, I, I really mourn and grieve over, over, my, uh, over the, my inability to speak Cree and pray in, in, in my own language. And I know that it impacts on the prayers that I say. Um, but yeah, so, that, so this is what I was thinking about also as I was doing this ceremony. But then as I did the ceremony, 
there were a bunch of different ideas that came to me or were presented to me by the land. So I just wanted to share a few of those. Um, but first, I'm going to share a little video. With you that sort of describes it on the land where I did the ceremony. All right. Uh, so I'm hoping you'd be able to hear this. So. so if I'm here, it's relatively calm. So it's like I can hear the hear the traffic on the on the road, and it's part of totally part of this world. If I take a few steps out this way, it gets windier and windier. So if I'm here, all I hear is the wind and the waves. And it's like that world is totally receded. But obviously, if I take a few more steps, I'm going to be totally in that world. So right here, so where I'm standing right now, is really that transition zone where I'm still in one space, but I can really feel the turbulence of that, where there's the sharp transition zone. If I step, take a couple of steps back, I don't feel anything that way. If I take steps this way, I'm totally into that zone. So right here, is, it's like all the turbulence is happening right here. Okay, um, I'll go back to the PowerPoints. So for me, there was something really important about that transition zone, all right? So this is what lessons or what, what ideas came to me, um, insights came to me <laughs> when, I did the, when I did that ceremony. All right, so that's, that land there is, is called Skinner's Head headland. Um, so I, I, I observed a lot of different things there through that ceremony and through being there before and after the ceremony. All right. Um, one of the things is, is that is really became clear, uh, clear was the sort of the difference between it or where things meet together. So it's like where the air meets the water. That's when you get like waves, right? Um, and when oh, it's, it's it's really hard to describe this, uh, but where I guess where we live on our normal everyday lives is where the land and the air meet together, right? And that's just what we're used to. We're used to walking on land, but being in the air. That's where. So we're used to wind. We're used to things like that. Where the land meets the water, that's where there's currents underwater and stuff. So we're not as used to living in that in that zone. In, in the, the land where the water meets the air, that's another, that's where waves are. We're, again, we're not really used to, to, to that. Um, that and that's just like the regular old um, ripply waves that you see. But when you bring all those, all those things together where the land and the air and the water all meet together, that's where you get the, like the big breaking waves. And that's where there is a whole lot of turbulence, all right? So the closer to the edge of that you get, the greater the turbulence is. So if it is really windy, you're going to have bigger waves and you're going to have breaking waves and it's going to be really noisy. Um, if the, well, if the land is really turbulent, it's going to be also really noisy. If it's like it's an earthquake, it causes those big waves as well. Or if the, um, you know, if there's been a disturbance in the water, it also causes that, that it, it, all of those things in, increase and they're most felt at that transition zone where the turbulence is, all right? Um, so I guess that area around that, that, that transition zone is where you can really see the greatest amounts of change and difference. You know, that, and that, you know, that can be, that's especially visible when those three elements meet together. And being in that transition zone or looking in that transition zone, can be, you know, that can be really fun because that's like where you go surfing or hang gliding. But it's also can be really dangerous because that's where people drown or ships crash or whatever. All right. 
but it's also kind of different, you know, in a sort of a physical part of a spiritual sense. <laughs> it also makes it difficult to conduct ceremony there because it's for, you know, like the, it's the very practical things. It's like really difficult to light a smudge or, or anything like that in that area because it's always windy all the time, right? Um, so there's that, that transition zone always has that turbulence and that turbulence is like that wind, right? Or those, those big waves. So it's important to recognize that you can step back out of that transition zone or step forward into it, all right? And that we're constantly making that move and that, we, that that is a part of what we do in ceremony is to deliberately make that move, all right? So sometimes you have to step back from that transition zone and so, so that you can hear more clearly. Uh, you can light your smudge. <laughs> then you can step into that and you can reflect on what you learned while you're in that turbulence. You have to step back out of it in order to reflect on it, but back into a safe space that's safer. So it's a bit quieter in your mind and your spirit to reflect on what you learned. Because when you're in that space, it's too volatile really to, to incorporate what you're learning. Um, but it's like when we step back from that, either you can step back or step you know, totally into it. That, you know, if you step totally into the water, then you can just float or you can step back on the land. You can just sit down or I guess you can step up into the air if you're flying somehow. Um, but that's where we spend most of our top lives is just sitting on the land or uh, whatever, right? But every once in a while, it's important for us to go closer to that edge in order to learn. So that transition zone can be a whole bunch of different things. Um, <clears throat> but I guess the importance of this for ceremony is that that transition is like that physical manifestation of that transition zone, I think is also really analogous. Is that the right word? Yes, I think it is of <laughs> the transition between the physical and the spiritual realm. All right, and also probably emotional and, and mental realms as well. Um, so, and if you think about say like a sweat lodge, even like when you enter and exit a sweat lodge, there's a symbolic transition that you go through as you exit a sweat lodge that's sort of almost symbolic of giving birth. So it's like transitioning from this sacred ceremonial space into the outside world. Um, so there's those transition zones that we're, that we're normally, normally uh, accustomed to when we do our ceremonies, right? Um, and I think a lot of our ceremonies are built around deliberately and safely tr going through those transition zones. So deliberately entering into sacred space so we can learn what we learn or do what we do in ceremony. That's the whole point of ceremonies oftentimes is deliberately entering into that sacredness, sacred space. All right, so that's what I learned from uh, doing the ceremony on the land. But then it's like, all right, so that's any ceremony. But then what I was there for was learn, well, how do you apply that into when you're doing digital, when you're stepping into the digital realm? So like that's, I was talking about the transition between the spiritual and the physical realm or between you know, land and air, land and water. How do you apply those lessons when we move into the digital space? Um, and I guess the first thing we need to remember, though, is that change is, in, change is inevitable. So it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. So I think it's more up to us to decide on how we want to deliberately or intentionally change how we do things to make them better. Because if we don't take control of it, it's going to change and it won't, we won't have any say in whether it's going to be better or worse or whatever. It's just going to happen without us having any say in it. So it's better for us to do this deliberately, do these changes deliberately. So in order to do that, I think that we need to re-examine and affirm our underlying beliefs and those beliefs that we want to hold dear. And then from there, create new protocols around how we are going to adapt our behavior into this new context that's a digital context. That's kind of like, you know, every, those of you that are familiar with going to ceremonies, like every, different nation that you go to or any like elder that you go to they all have their own sort of different protocols different rituals for how you do like a sweat lodge for example 
because they have the under, but they all have the same sort of underlying philosophy of why you're doing the sweat. But the, the, the physical context of the land that you're doing it on has meant that, oh, you will, well, we do it here this way. And if you go to a different community to say, no, well, we do our sweats this way, so it's different there. And that's all right, it's because it's all, they're all coming from the same underlying heart and <laughs> belief system for why they're doing the sweats. It's just the, the different contexts make them do it, have different uh, rituals for how they do it. So what I would like to see is uh, let's take that same heart and that same philosophical and then recognize, oh yeah, okay, we're into a new context when we start to step into the digital realm. So we just need to be a bit more deliberate in how we choose our protocols and rituals for engaging with each other online and not just resorting to the default setting that um, gets pushed on us by other people. So we need to choose these things for ourselves. All right, so if you remember, there was like I sort of had three different, broke that up into sort of three different things before. One was around like the, the importance of traveling and then the importance of language and then the importance of the transition zone. So I'll go into those and how they you know, impact it on the digital realm. All right, now, again, when you start to think about that traveling, the whole point of it is that you are um, preparing yourself to do something. And that preparation is important to, for keeping yourself safe. Um, but it's really problematic when our physical homes also become our digital offices. And then we also try to make that a spiritual space. It can be, there's like, we lack that separation. Now, again, you can't be in ceremony all the time. You need to move in and out of it. You need to prepare for ceremony, you enter into ceremony, you do a ceremony, then you leave. And then you have to integrate that knowledge back into your everyday lifestyle. Or at least you need to go offline to go to the bathroom every once in a while. So we didn't need to start to think about how we manage how we're going to enter and leave digital space and be a bit more conscious of how we do that. All right. So uh, um, talking with another one of my digital, one of my doctoral students, she's talking about how when uh, in her um, religious practice, they have been experimenting with doing meditation retreats online and how so they have set up rituals around all right well you have to go and go do your shopping <laughs> you get yourself a cup of tea and whatever else you're going to need you're going to need for food for the next few hours or day or however long it's going to be you get rid of the kids you turn off all your phones and everything else and then you enter into the meditation retreat so even though you're in the same physical space, you attend to all the all your physical needs and all the distractions first before you come to the, do the, your, your meditation. So they, they deliberately made the list of everything that you need to do before you come. Uh, so I was thinking sort of that's similar to like when you're, so how can we do this when we're in digital ceremonies? And it's like, well, if you think about, say, if you go to a sweat and it's, you spend a lot of time before the sweat, like, lighting the fire and you're sitting around by the rocks, waiting for the rocks to warm up and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's important part also of the ceremony because it's a really important part of building community. And it's like you're you're hanging out with other people that are gonna do a sweat. And it's like, you know, they're like-minded people and you know, sort of like have all these little things that you do to sort of meet people and, and get to know them better and sort of support one another. And and then afterwards, it's also you like you hang out and have a, a feast together. And it's, that's also part of the ceremony, right? But starting to think about, well, we do that, that because that's an important part of, of building community. And I think that that's something that we're all missing when we try to do things online is that, that community building. So we need, I think that probably we need to think about different ways of how we can go about having those pre-ceremony mingling space <laughs> uh, before we go into digital ceremony. So it's like, is it possible to sort of have like the have a waiting room, say, you know, you probably all were in a waiting room before you came onto this. So we need to think of ways, well, maybe we need to make uh, make it so that Zoom, when you're in the waiting room, you're, it's kind of more like breakout rooms where it's like you're, in, you're checked into a waiting room with three or four other people. So you can sort of just have a talk with each other, get to know who else is gonna be attending the meeting and that sort of thing. Uh, sort of like you do a digital handshake with people that are in that space. Um, one thing that you also have like in ceremony is uh, someone that's like a, well, there's a couple of different roles, well, there's a lot of different roles in ceremonies, but one of the roles is like the doorkeeper, right? And it's like, we've already kind of got that in, in digital ceremonies where there's like the someone that sort of lets you into the room. 
but part of the role of that doorkeeper also is to sort of keep other things out that aren't supposed to be in there, right? Like sort of in a spiritual sense. So we need to be a bit more conscious of the, that doorkeeper role and also the, the role of the ceremony leader in holding that space and keeping that space safe for everyone else. All right, so I think that uh, as teachers, we've probably already been doing this on Zoom and sort of creating our own little rituals about how we hold safe space on Zoom. So that's really great. So I think that that's something we just need to be a bit more conscious of. Um, so now as we're, and I, when I was talking about language and Cree and, you know, being my very limited bilingualism, I think we also have to recognize that right now is the first generation of people, say anyone that's under 24, 25, has been raised bilingual. But it's not bilingual English and Cree, it's bilingual English and digital. Uh, and you know how I said that, you know, that praying in Cree changes the way that you pray, but also like thinking in digital language changes the way that young people think. So, but we have to be conscious of that and sort of how we go about doing things because it's also a matter of um, the limit. There's, there's real limitations to a binary language when you have an analog brain. Um, our brain's not digital, it's analog. So we have to, but we have to be conscious of those, of those things, right? And I really noticed that this, um, kids are a lot more used to, the, the kid, bilingual kids, bilingualism, digital and, and English, are a lot more used to linear systems and, or a flowchart type of design of decision-making where they have like a, a yes, no, either or decisions. And they're really, really functional at, at making those decisions really quickly that, kind of blow anyone, everyone else away that are older and not used to making that kind of things. But, and they're also used to sort of having the concept of like being on Zoom and you certainly teleport yourself around this grid. So you're not in one stable physical space, but your avatar is moving all over the place whenever anyone speaks to you. That's not a big deal for them. Um, so they, they're, they're easy to... The other thing that is they have really good singular focus of attention so they can really focus in on this thing but have a really really good peripheral vision as it were around their screen so they're even though you're focusing on one thing on the screen kids these days are really good at focusing on that one thing but then it's like really also really good at in the peripheral vision noticing if anything changes uh, and especially you know kids that game are gamers uh, really have this really good attention to detail in the small space but also really are able to multitask uh, with what's happening around that space as well. That those of us that grew up non-digitally maybe are better at doing that out on the land where we can you know, be looking at one individual plant, but recognizing that the, how everything else around us is influencing us, is influencing that, influencing that one plant. So it's like, we have to recognize that they do that online. We don't do that online as much as kids that are, digi that are, that are um, bilingual do. Um, uh, bilingual kids also have the, a really long attention span, but that attention span is forced into them by a rapid response requirement. So it's like their attention span is like a forced attention span because they, the way online environment is, is designed is to give them adrenaline release. Um, so it's like they can have a really long, they, they can sit and play a game for hours and hours and hours because they keep getting that drip fed adrenaline through responses that are happening in. Inversely, they have a really short attention span if they're not in a life-threatening situation because they've got that become adrenaline junkies in a sense, the, the, the adrenal response to what's happening on in gaming. Um, <clears throat> so it's like, so... What we might find really difficult, you know, native speakers or people who are bilingual from birth, what might find it really easy for, for us to change our prayer style is going to be different. But for people that are, because we need to re retrain our, our brains, but for people that are already, bi already are, are able to think in this, this way, it's going to be different for them. It's going to be easier for them. And so it's like both of us have to adapt. <laughs> okay. It's like, even just thinking of say something like uh, talking circles. 
say we are trained to behave in, in certain ways, right? So it's like, well, we're trained in a talking circle to listen with intention, right? So you're not just listening with your ears. You're listening as a way of physically demonstrating a respectful, non-judgmental, focused attention, right? So it's not, you're trained to not anticipate what you're going to say next, but to totally pay attention to uh, what's happening around you. So everyone knows when it's going to be your turn to speak, and everyone knows that they're going to get an equitable chance to speak. So part of what we do maybe need to be is retraining, well, how do we do this in a digital environment? So like, how do we can we recreate something like a talking stick or reinvent systems to, so that those protocols around who speaks and how you listen, but also reinvent systems for getting people to focus and pay attention without having to resort to that adrenaline response, right? Um, you know, and we're all accustomed to what we do. So, and you get, and you know, you, you'll, you notice this when we first moved online, everyone is so tired of Zoom, but you'll notice this now when you go back into real life meetings, it's like really tiring because <laughs> it's like you get used to what you're used to and it becomes really tiring to do something different. Um, all right, so that's just about thinking about how we, those protocols of what we're gonna do are important and, and recognizing the importance of, uh, of language and, and recognizing that kids these days are bilingual, it's just in digital. Um, and again, start to think about the importance of transition zones. So we can't be in spiritual space all the time. We have to move in or we have to prepare ourselves. We move in, have a ceremony. Hopefully something happens there, Sherry, you move out, you sit down on the ground again, and then you sort of you need that in order to um, integrate what you've learned in that transition zone, all right? So we also have to recognize there's gonna be extra turbulence. So, so remember, it's like there was that turbulence between the wind and the water and the air, you know, where they all break together and there's like, it's always windy and wavy there, but it's like you had an old other dimension when you start to add in the spiritual dimension, you had another dimension again, when you start to bring it into to digital space. So we have to think about that and how all of that extra turbulence is going to be there when we're working with spiritual ideas in an online environment. All right, so that maybe needs to be a focus or part of our training is to deliberately focusing our attention, attention and intention um, so that we can enter that space more carefully. All right, so part of that is, is um, We'll be doing things like really looking at what the principles and the, pro the protocols are that we practice in following our principles, right? Um, things like deliberately turn taking, right? With silence in between, that's a big part of the of talking circles is silence while people think about what things people have said and integrate it into their, before they talk. We don't tend to do that online very well. Um, but different, a lot of different principles involved. Um, and then moving in and out, a big part of what we do in research is look for different patterns, right? We look for cycles. So we need to, need to look at how we can do this in, in transition and in transitioning into a digital space. Um, and also we need to recognize the role that land itself plays. So the, the land itself is critical, plays a critical strategic role in shaping and shoring up like strengthening and holding and sharing of indigenous knowledge so the land itself can heal us or it can hurt us so that we need to remember that as we also as we work in an online environment there you know we have laws of the land like uh Pastau and chinuin like there's natural law and there's going to be natural consequences for breaking those laws but there's also sacred law and we have to be conscious of not breaking sacred law because if we break sacred law we'll have consequences, not just for us, but for seven generations down the road. Now we have stories that we have that relay each of these. Uh, and if we, we have to be conscious of how we do this. So we have to be conscious of if we can and how can we use the laws of the land and adapt them and make them into internet protocols, digital protocols. So I think for me, the biggest one that we need to try and do is practice love and action. Um, <laughs> so our Sugi Hiwe would, now practicing love and action in a digital sense is like, here's a hint, 
doesn't have to do with porn. <laughs> that's, that's your real love, all right? But it also has to do with like how it's bringing all of us into the, into the equation, how we can do this in an online space. So part of it is humor and, and not taking ourselves too seriously, but it's acting in a caring way. It's sharing sharing with each other, and uh, but it's also being compassionate. And it, to me, all of those things lead to truth. So when, if we can do these and practice love and action in our digital space, then we'll also be able to um, conduct ceremony online. It's going to be a totally different kind of ceremony. Obviously, you can't do a sweat lodge ceremony online, but there's different kinds of ceremonies that we can develop and we can use in the online space. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I was conscious, oh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple questions in the last bit, but hopefully it makes a bit of sense at least. We have a couple of questions. Rebecca, do you want to take over? Yeah, um, I don't know if you had to see them. As they, that was great, Sean. Thank you so much. It gave us so much to to think about. And there's some interesting questions that came that came through. I don't know. I, I can read them for you out loud if you'd like. I'll give you some time to contemplate. Okay. Um, so Sarah says. You speak of the impact of language. My intuition is that somehow singing in English is a closer communication than speaking, and I feel called to sing in the outdoors. How does this resonate with what you speak of with thanks? Well, yeah, and I, I think that actually in sound is a, is a really important thing, and it's really difficult to transmit over an online space. Uh, like most ceremonies that you go to have singing involved in them. So it's like, if you are, I guess, if you're approaching the land in a ceremonial way, there's going to be a song involved and, and that's great. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that works online because we are limited because it is digital communication. It's like, especially if we're limited by something like Zoom, only one of us can sp speak at a time. It makes it really hard to harmonize, <laughs> as it were. And that harmony is not just like, well, oh, that sounds good when people are speaking in harmony. It also creates a resonance within our bodies when we harmonize. It's not like, a, it's harmonance. <laughs> I don't even know how to, how, to, how to phrase that is different than, it's not, not a musical concept. It's like a, we have a, it makes our bodies resonate in the same way that creates a, a I think brings us closer together in relationship. But it's hard. I, I haven't figured out how to do that online yet. It's probably possible, but Zoom doesn't make it very easy. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense or not. <laughs> it kind of leads kind of neat into the next question. Um, Jacqueline says, uh, I came across an article a while ago about a project by an Indigenous group in Australia that was trying out virtual reality as a way to engage young adults in traditional teachings. Ash, uh, can't remember the name of the project. What are your thoughts on using VR for online ceremony? Yeah, yeah, well, it, it, I, it's fine. I, I, the, to me, our ceremonies are gonna change. It's just a matter of, we need to be a bit more deliberate and, and, and change them intentionally into what we want so that they continue to represent our underlying philosophy rather than just letting them just run off on their own. Um, so yeah, I think virtual reality is really cool. Um, there's Second Life, in, um, trying to think of what the name of the digital space is in Second Life that's specifically indigenous. Um, I can't remember, but there is, yeah, there's Second Life places for indigenous people online. Uh, and I know that VR program you're talking about, and I'm trying to think of, it's Margut. I can't remember what it is, but they also have, actually one of the things that I like about that group is that they also have uh, protocols in place where if they are sharing certain things, you have to, they're like protected spaces. So only people from that community are, can go into there. Uh, and I think it's, well, it was intended that it be, McCur to, that's it. Uh, it was intended to be that, um, said so like only elders, from the community could give permission for people to be there or not. So it's like you could have sacred stuff on there then that wasn't just open to anyone that you had to be initiated. So, so if, 
if you're supposed to be initiated to see something that the elders would have to vote for you that you're initiated to get into that space online. And I think that's really cool. The problem with it is, is it needs someone as a that has the IT skills to be able to manage that <laughs> because the IT person can see everything. So it's like, oh, well, it's kind of protected, but kind of not. So it's, it can be really good, but there's also problems with it, yeah. Okay, and that's all we have for questions, um, unless anyone can, people have a second, but I think that's all. Um, just from like on behalf of Rebecca, uh, who had to pop out, and the whole faculty of education and the WISE program and our ITAP program. And we have so many really uh, amazing Indigenous students. So I think you gave a lot of uh, ideas uh, for them to think about for digitizing ceremony. So thank you for your time and for joining us so early tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, almost 10 o'clock here now. It's not that, not that early. Not that bad. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Um, your, your, your day has already been so productive. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your insight um, and, uh, and taking the time with us today. No, you're very welcome. And I hope that it made you think. I, I would say one thing I would encourage people is don't accept everything that I say, but stop and think about it first and accept the stuff that makes sense and don't accept the stuff that doesn't. <laughs> I don't want things to become dogmatic. I think that's the problem with digitizing things too. We can't. We have to avoid dogma. <laughs> a good note to end on. Thank you. All right. Good Thank night. you so much.